your Bibles to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. If you need the notes, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. Preaching through the book of Psalms. Each one's unique, each one's special, each one will be a help. I can't but feel this is, I know it's apropos to my life many times, and I know it'll be apropos to your life, but boy, you need to get a hold of this thought tonight. Not, there you go, and I started to say we're not going to be long tonight, but we never can tell. But we've you, you, we got to get a hold of this idea of how to survive in a dry, thirsty land. I've seen too many Christians have not made it. Too many Christians have fallen by the wayside. Too many Christians have gotten discouraged because they find themselves in a dry, thirsty land and don't know how to deal with it. So we're looking tonight at Psalm 63, a very simple psalm, a very short psalm, but one that will help us, one that I must apply, one I've applied to some aspect in my life, but I need to do it more so, and you need to certainly understand it. So very simple thought tonight, looking at from David, God speaking to us, about surviving in a dry, thirsty land. Psalm 63, beginning in verse number 1. O God, Thou art my God, early will I seek Thee. My soul thirsteth for Thee, my flesh longeth for Thee, in a dry and thirsty land where no water is, to see Thy power and Thy glory. So as I have seen there Thee in the sanctuary, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, my right hand, thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. Every one that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Father, we need you tonight. Lord, just some simple things. But you've got it in there because you know that we experience these events. We experience these times in our lives. So, Lord, I pray that tonight we would, first of all, recognize those things are common. And then looking tonight how to survive them. And not just survive them, but how to come out stronger. Not just to survive them, but come out better. Not just to survive them, but come out closer to you. Not just survive them, but better, be better vessels for you. So, Holy Spirit, speak to us tonight like only you can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. David is, again, apparently on the run. We're not sure, so sure exactly the timetable, but it says a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. But David is on the run, and I can't help but think this is, again, a time where he's on the run, not so much from Saul, but probably Jonathan. Maybe early on in his fleeing from Jonathan. Jonathan, of course, uh, or not Jonathan, I'm sorry, uh, Absalom, his son, I'm sorry, boy, I must be getting old. Absalom, his son, was trying to take over, so now he's on the run, and I think this might have been right on that first night or two after he found himself on the run from him. And here we find David speaking, and he says, in the end of verse number one, My flesh longeth for thee in a dry, thirsty land. David, no doubt, was looking at the land he was in. He was out in the wilderness, out in the wilderness there of Judah. It was a dry land, a very thirsty land. When land is like that, it means there's no water, there's no moisture. And when a land is really dry, it absorbs any moisture that comes into it. You pour a little bit on and it just gets absorbed. It just draws right in. You cannot catch it. You cannot retain it. It just gets sucked right in. So he was looking at that in a physical realm. But I think also we can see the idea about him and us often living in a dry, thirsty, spiritual land. See, when you and I are in those dry, 
thirsty lands spiritually, those seasons in our life where it's dry, where it's thirsty, and what little moisture may come in, what little blessings might come, boy, it's immediately absorbed, it's immediately drawn, and there's just nothing there to collect, it's nothing there for us to, to hold on to, and it just seems to absorb every bit of moisture that comes, and it's a dry, thirsty land. We often use the expression, somebody might say, how's your Christian life right now? You probably wouldn't say this because we're too prideful, but many times we have to say, it's dry. It's just dry. There's no moisture, there's no uh, cooling about it, there's no hope, seems like it's just dry and thirsty. I, I, I do not have, I'm not satisfied, I'm not happy with what I've got, but I'm just living in a spiritual dry condition. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but I can guarantee you, if you've been saved very long, you've experienced those times where in your life you say, you know, I'm just in a dry spell. I'm just in a spell in my life that it's dry. I'm not seeing the fruit. I'm not seeing the excitement. I don't feel like I should. I think that I should anyway. I don't feel like I used to. I don't feel like things are going well. I'm just in a dry, thirsty land. I'm just dry. That can happen in your Christian walk that your life becomes dry. Your Christian walk becomes very dry. Your devotions, you can look back at different times in your devotions, and boy, you open up the Word of God, and the Holy Spirit spoke to you. In fact, if you had a journal, if you were keeping a journal of your devotions, you could say, boy, I can look back, and every single day during this season of my life, God spoke to me. I had tears. I had excitement. I had some truth. I was able to had something to speak to people about. I couldn't wait to, uh, to text my friend or call my children and let them know what God said to me today. Man, it was just day after day, week after week. God was so fresh to me. God was so real to me. It was God was so sincere in my life. Boy, it was just such a blessing. If you were keeping that same journal, you could look back and there may be days where you look and I read. And you forced something to put in your journal. You forced something, but it was just nothing real fresh. It was nothing really exciting. It was not something really new. So it can happen in your devotional life where you just don't feel it. It can happen in your Christian walk. Your prayers are just dry. I mean, there are times in your Christian life, and I trust there are, where your prayers are vibrant, where your prayers are real. And even as you begin to pray, you sense God's presence. You know your prayers are ascending into heaven as the incense does. And it's just real, and it's just powerful, and it's just refreshing, and you get off your knees. In fact, you don't want to stop praying. Have you ever had times like that where you look at your watch and you say, Lord, i got to go. i got to go. It's work time. I'm going to be late. I must go, or I must fix uh, my, the breakfast for the family. And you say, I, I hate to stop. It's been so good, but Lord, we'll pick it up here later. But I just, I just have to go. And you're just burdened by that. Or it seems like that, that you start to pray, and it's been all of a sudden you look, and it's been a half hour, 45 minutes, an hour. And you're living in those fresh times, those damp times, those, those satisfying times. But then there's other times you just go through the motion. And it's just dry. It's just dry. So it can happen in your Christian walk. You just don't feel it. It can happen to you in your Christian walk in a church service. You might be in your Christian walk. As you go through life, you can say, boy, other people around me are being blessed. Other people around me are moved to tears. I can see the Holy Spirit working in other people's lives during the preaching and during the singing, Sunday after Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. But for me, it's just, it's just been dry. There's just been nothing revelate, revealed to me. There's been nothing God really honestly speaking to me about. I'm just kind of dry in my life. It can happen in a church. The ministries just seem to be dry. Here's the danger. When we get in those dry, thirsty seasons, those dry, thirsty lands, the real tendency will be to quit. The devil will come and say, it's not worth it. It wasn't real to begin with. Either that or you're so carnal, you're so backslidden, God's not going to use you again. But generally we just think it's just not worth it. And so we back off. And so we, we, get, we spend less time in the Bible, which is not going to help you. It's going to make it more dry. It, we'll, 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 we'll shorten our prayer time if we pray at all, and that won't help because that'll just make us more dry. Well, I'll skip going to church. I just won't do, uh, do that. No. The danger is we'll quit. The danger is we'll back up. The danger is we just won't be involved, and we just get farther away, and the first thing you know, it's the people in the church are saying, whatever happened to brother so-and-so? Whatever happened to sister so-and-so? Where's that family that was coming? You don't want to be 
that person. You don't want to be that family. You don't want to be those that are sitting at home and say, well, nobody cares, nobody cares. No, it's this dry, thirsty land. So we're looking tonight about how to survive a dry, thirsty land. And that's what we have with David. Very simple thoughts today, but you've got to have these down. I challenge you to put it somewhere where you can refer to them again. When you get to the place, you say, boy, it's just been dry. You say, preacher, have you ever had any dry spells? Oh, yes, I have. And if you get those dry spells, obviously one of the first things you need to do is check your heart. Let God check. Make sure there's no sin in your life. Make sure God's not pulled away because of sin. But you can just put it down. I've known preachers that talk about, well, they had five years of dryness or six months of dryness. Maybe in your Christian life you could put a thing on. But then it finally the rains come. The refreshing rains come. The earlier and latter rains come. And you're refreshed again. But don't quit during those dry times. How to survive the dry, thirsty land. Very simple tonight. Notice, first of all, we see three regiments. Three regiments. David here, as he explains how he's surviving, how he's going to survive this dry, thirsty land. He's in that dry, thirsty land. He's got it. He's there. He's on the run. And now he says, I'm in a dry, thirsty land. And he lays out three regiments on how to do that, how we're going to survive. Now, there's only three things in this psalm that David is doing. We're going to find, besides the regiments, we're going to find that he's got some resolutions. But three regiments, three things that he is doing, and then we'll find the resolutions. He says, what I will do, what I shall do, what I will. So he got, But right now, this is what he's doing. So he's got three regiments that he does. By the way, a regiment, as you know, is something you do consistently. It's something you do always. It's a regiment in your life. Uh, you wake up. I hope you do. You eat breakfast. Most folks, that's a regiment in your life. Lunch is a regiment in your life. Coffee, some folks have coffee as a, the regiment in their life. As a matter of fact, they're not even know, they don't even know they're alive until their second cup. Anybody like that? Yeah. I mean, it's just a regiment. It's what I do. And when I get to work, I do this. These regiments, these things that are in place that you do every day, every time, whether you feel like it or not, whether you've got time for it or not. In fact, you always make sure you have time for the regiments in your life. And so David here said, I'm going to dry, thirsty land. How am I going to survive? I, he said, I need a way that I can make it through this dry, thirsty land so I don't quit, so I don't get defeated, so I can stay right with God, and so I can stay useful for God. So we're seeing three regiments, things that you'll do no matter what. By the way, let me say, what you do and what I do determines how we act. What we do, these things we have in our life, determines how we act and it determines how we will react. So let's find these three regiments he's had in his life. These three things he said, this is what I do. This is what I'm doing right now and will continue to do so that I might put these other things in practice. Very quickly, number one, regiment number one, claim your God. Claim your God. Look at verse number one. Oh God. By the way, that oh there represents a great sound of uh, exclamation, a uh, pleading, a beseeching. Oh God, thou art my God. Boy, he starts out right by saying, you are my God. He didn't say you will be my God. He didn't say I shall make you my God. He said you are my God. See, we must claim him as our God. Now, we, by the way, even if you don't claim him, he's still God. God does not need you to believe in him to be God. He's God whether you believe in Him or not. He's God whether or not you trust Him or not. He is God. He does not need our approval or our faith for Him to be God. He already is. But here He is, as David is speaking to us, He says, O oh God, Thou art my God. We must own our God. We must own Him as ours. We sing that song, He is mine and I am His. That whole idea, He is my God. He's God already, but now I claim Him as mine. In other words, I claim that relationship that God has promised. I claim that closeness God wants to provide. It's not me doing anything, but I'm saying He is my God. And so I must claim Him. I must claim Him as my own God. He's got to be mine personally. See, if you'll never survive the dry, thirsty land if you're trying to survive on somebody else's God. You're not going to survive the dry, thirsty land if you're counting on your relationship with their God. Well, it's my parents. They have a close walk with God. No, you're not going to make it that way. Well, my pastor has a close walk with God. This is his. No, it must be your God personally. Can you make it your God? Have you declared Him to be your God? By the way, without God, nothing makes sense. Are you listening to me? Without God, 
Can you imagine what this world looks at right now with Iran and with Iraq and with all, even in America, all the rioting? You say, boy, this, how confusing, how terrible it is. Without God, it makes no sense. Now, with God, we don't know why necessarily, but we know God is working. We know the end times. We know the, the nature of man. But without God in context, this world doesn't make sense. Without God, without our God in context in our lives, we have no purpose. Can you imagine not knowing God and not having a God? What purpose would life be? No wonder we're in and those folks are in and out and up and down. There'd be no hope. But we find we must own our God. So it can't be your parents' God. It can't be your neighbor's God. It can't be your spouse's God. It can't be the church's God. It can't be the pastor's God. It must be your God. So preacher, how in the world am I going to survive when these dry, thirsty lands? By the way, the dry seasons, the dry seasons may last a day. They may last a week. They may last a month like David's was here or years. It could actually be two or three years, five years, ten years. We have no idea how God's working, but during those dry seasons, if we're going to survive, we must claim Him as our God. Through these dry, He's still God, and He's my God. This dry times, He's still God, and He's my God that I'm looked to and serving. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up because He who controls these dry seasons is my God. So number one, first regiment, He says, I'm going to claim my God. He must be my own God. O God, Thou art my God. He said, You're God, but You're my God. I'm glad I have a God I can trust. I'm glad I have a God I can love. But you claim your God. Number two, a second regiment. First, you've got to make sure, claim Him as your God. <laughs> he is mine. I know Him, and He is mine. Number two, must remember your God. Must remember your God. Verse number six, again, we're hitting these regiments, the only things He's doing right now. Verse number six, I will remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. He said, I'm going to remember you, and I'm going to meditate on you. He said, I'm going to remember on my bed. I don't know what David was sleeping on out there in the wilderness. It may have been like when we go to family camp. You may have brought your whole bed. I know some folks bring their bed. It may be air mattresses. Or you may just like to sleep on the ground, but whatever it is, he's out there in the wilderness. If he's running from Absalom, he just got out there. He didn't take a lot of supplies. He was on the run from that night, and he just went. The old preacher once said, when the bed is too soft, so are we. In other words, when we have enough, too much rest, too much ease, we get soft, we get forgetful. We get plowed. When the bed and our surroundings, in other words, the land we're in is just so comfortable, we tend to forget God. Here he said, but on my bed in the night watches, all through the night, I'm going to remember God. Boy, we've got to spend some time remembering God. Don't be forgetful about God. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to remember my God. When I'm having difficulties, when it seems long nights, when I can't sleep, when I'm burdened because it's a dry land, I'm just going to... I'm just going to remember my God. I'm glad we've got a book that reminds us about God. I'm glad we've got the Holy Spirit that reminds us, who lives inside of us, that reminds us about God. But remember your God. Remember His holiness. Remember His goodness. Remember His power. Remember His creation. Just start making a list of things that you know about your God. Remember your God. Spend time just thinking about Him and remembering Him. So the first three regiments. First of all, claim your God. And then remember your God. Number three, follow hard after your God. And again, I'm emphasizing your God. I must do it for my God, the God I have made in my life, that same God. We have the same God, but He's got to be mine. Follow hard after God. Look at verse number 8. My soul followeth hard after thee. He said it's following hard after. The word follow hard there means adhere to, to be glued to, to be attached to. He said my soul follows hard after God. You know, he's having a dry spell. He's living in a dry and thirsty land. But he's saying, my soul is cleaving to God. My soul is adhering to God. It is stuck with, I'm not allowing any space. I'm not allowing any distance. I'm not allowing anything. He said, I'm not just following from a distance. I'm not following back from a few strides. I'm not following back from, oh, maybe a quarter of a mile. He says, no, I am stuck right with God. I am following step by step, moment by moment with Him. Follow hard after God. Leave no room between you and your God. 
Yeah, those are three regiments he's laid out. Those are the only things in this psalm that he is doing. The rest of them are what is what he says he shall do, he will do, he anticipates doing. But those are the regiments. So, preacher, how can I survive the dry spells? Make sure you have the re- these three regiments in place. By the way, you need the regiments before you hit the dry land. These regiments must be in place before you hit the desert. These regiments must be in place before you find yourself in that dry, thirsty land. So while the, while the land is not dry, when your devotions are sweet, when your prayer is uplifting, when the services and God speaks to your heart and the service is going on, things are, boy, it's just wonderful. You must keep these regiments in place because when you make the turn, even as David did, <clears throat> If his, again, if this is his first few days, right after being chased out of Jerusalem, he finds himself now in a dry, thirsty land. How's he going to survive? He says, well, I'm going to survive by making sure I've had those things in place before I came. So we've got the three regiments very quickly. Now we have the three resolutions. Three resolutions. He said, now that I find myself in a dry land, here's some resolutions I must make. I've got my regiments in place. Boy, you've got to have those regiments there. But he said, here's my three resolutions to help me survive in the dry, thirsty lands. Very simply, we'll be done. Number one, focus your seeking on your God. Focus your seeking on your God. Verse number one, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek Thee. He said, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to seek you. He said, regardless of what else is going on, I'm going to seek you. We must focus our seeking on God. He said, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. Early will I seek thee. By the way, early is an important word. Early in your life, seek God. Boy, don't say when I get to be an adult or get to be 30 or get to be 40. You young folks that are in your 20s, don't say, well, when I get in my 30s, I'll I'll seek God. When I get in my 40s, I'll seek. No, seek Him early. Early begin to seek God. Early in your life. Seek Him early in the day. I believe that's what He's speaking about there as well, in the day. He said, early I'm going to seek you. In other words, as soon as I wake up, I'm going to seek you. I'm not going to wait until uh, mid-afternoon. I'm not going to wait until the lunch break. He said, I'm going to seek you early. So we've got to do our seeking early in our life early in the day, and early in God's judgment. In other words, oh, I think God's got an issue with me. I think He's revealing a sin to me. I'm going to seek Him early and get those things taken care of. Don't wait until you lose your job. Don't wait until your health is completely gone. As God brings the chastening to you, whoa, no, early, as soon as God reveals the sin, as soon as God begins that chastening upon your life, no, seek Him and seek being right with Him. Three resolutions, focus You're seeking on your God. So I have to ask, what are you seeking? Verse number one, he said, I will seek thee. In your dry, thirsty lands, in your dry spells, stop and think, what am I looking for? What am I seeking in my life? What am I seeking in my soul? So preacher, how do I know what I'm seeking? One, by what you talk about. If somebody, oh, boy, as soon as you see him, how's things going? Oh, let me tell you about the new car I saw. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with the new car. Nothing wrong with that. But the last 20 times you talk to that person, that's all they're talking about, this different new car. I know what they're seeking. Hello. A new house, a new outfit. I don't know. It's what we speak about reveals what we're seeking, what we dream about, what we anticipate. In those dry lands, in those dry times, we've got to learn to turn our wanter toward Him. Turn our wanter. What do I want? I want Him. I may think I have a need of this and a need of that, but my wanter, my seeking, has got to be of God. First of all, notice a righteous desire. A righteous desire. Focus your seeking. On these, his is a resolution. He said, I will. He didn't say, I am seeking. He said, Thou art my God. Early will I seek. He says, This is my resolution. I'm going to seek you early in the day. I'm going to seek you early in my life and seek you early in my judgment. But we find then it's a righteous desire. A righteous desire. First of all, it's, a, it's personal. He said, I will seek thee, my soul. So you've got to have that desire, a personal desire. That means when you're alone, you got to say, God, I need, I, need to, I need to desire you. 
I'm seeking you, God. I'm focused on you. I want you. I am looking for you in my life. It must be personal. Not just because that's what the church does or what the family does, but it must be personal. This righteous desire, it's personal. It's powerful. The seeking of this desire, it must be a, a, a powerful desire. Look what it says. Thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land. Well, we're talking about not just desiring. We're talking about thirsting and longing for. I mean, just if you've ever been really, really thirsty, I'm not talking about, boy, I could use some Coke right now, or I could use some water right now, but we're talking about where you've really got the, where your tongue and your, is kind of cleaving to your mouth and your mouth is all dry and you just... No saliva at all, and your, your body is crying out for moisture. That's the kind he's talking about, thirst and longing. It ought, it's got to be a powerful, a powerful desire. It says, boy, my soul is thirsting for you. But not only that, it's a particular desire, a particular desire. Look at verse 2. Well, back in verse number 1, My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. He said, man, I need you. There's no water in here. He said, what are you seeking? What are you desiring? To see thy power and thy glory. He said, I want to see your power. And I want to see the, God, I want to see your power. I'm going to seek you. And as I seek in you and desire you, I want to see your power. Boy, when you're in a dry, thirsty land, you say, God, it's drying out. I'm going through a dry spell. I don't understand it. But my, my resolution is I'm desiring to seek you. I'm going to start focusing on seeking you. And how do I know what I'm looking for? I'm looking for your power in my life. I'm looking to see you do something mighty. I'm looking for you to do something miraculous. I'm looking for you to do something above board and above all things so I know it is you. Ladies and gentlemen, when you're in a dry and thirsty land and you turn to God and ask God to show you His power, and He does, boy, that'll give you some quenching of your thirst in that dry, thirsty land. He says, so I'm going to have this, this, this desire to see your power. And notice what it says, not just His power, but His glory. He said, I see, to see thy power and thy glory, the majesty of God, the power of God, the, the holiness of God, seeing his glory. But see, when you're in a dry, thirsty land, you could care less without this resolution to do so. Say, so, Lord, I must do this. As a Christian, if you're going to survive, if I'm going to survive, I must have this particular desire to see it, his power and his glory. Now, there's a little phrase there that I'm not quite so sure what all I want to do with. Notice what it says in verse 2. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Now, he's on the run, so he's not there with the, 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 the tabernacle. He's not there for the sanctuary. He says, but I saw it in the sanctuary. He said, I want to see your power. Look at it again. To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee, in the sanctuary. He said, just like I saw you, if I can put it in modern vernacular, just like I saw you in church, I want to see you again. Just like I saw you in the synagogue, I want to, or in the tabernacle, I want to see it again. Oh, I tell you what, let me ask you, do you come to church hoping to see God's power? Do you come to church hoping to see God's glory? That's what he said. He said, I'm desiring to see some particular working, your power and your glory, like I did in the sanctuary. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know about you, but as I begin to hear about that and think about that, something's burning in my heart that I want to see God's power in our church. I'm not, I cannot be satisfied. You say, well, preacher, we just haven't seen God do anything really miraculous in a long time. Guess what? That's the definition of a dry spell. Well, I've not seen Him's glory in our church in a long time. That's called a dry spell. But don't quit. Don't give up. Let's have a resolution right here that I'm going to seek it. I'm going to have this desire. I'm going to focus my seeking on God with a righteous desire to see His glory and to see His power in our church. Boy, if we start asking for it, we start seeking it, He will do it. So, three resolutions. Dry and thirsty land. Focus your seeking on your God. We've got a righteous desire. But not only our seeking is a righteous desire, we seek with the right driver. We seek with the right driver. Oh, we must hurry. Verse 2, to see thy power. So he's seeking, verse 1, to see his power and his glory as he's seen in the sanctuary because thy loving kindness is better than life. 
His loving kindness. Remember where David is. I don't know how long it's been since he'd seen any loving kindness from anybody else. His, his counselors had turned on him. His son had turned on him. His nation had turned on him. Just a few men with him. The rest of them said, yes, we've chased David out. We want Absalom to be our king. Absalom had stole their hearts. And so he was out there in the wilderness, on the run. But his driver to see God was God's loving kindness. See, when we start seeking Him and seeking our God, let it not be we seek Him for just what we want from Him, but seek Him for who He is and what He's given us already, His loving kindness. A lot of times, at least in the old days, we'd say, well, if Je since Jesus saved me, that's enough. If that's all He ever did for all eternity, that would be enough for me to praise Him forever. How many of you ever hear that expression? Well, He saved me, that ought to be enough, and it really should be enough. But guess what? We don't, <laughs> it's not enough for us. Our old fleshly nature, we want more blessings. We want more help. We want more growth. We want more relationship. We want more of this and more of that. But let's get back. He says, the driver for me seeking God, the right driver, what forces me to seek Him is not just because I feel bad, not just because I'm dry, not just because I want that feeling like I used to have, but because of His loving kindness. You need to focus on His. A right driver. A righteous desire. As we're seeking Him, the right desire. A right driver. And thirdly, a real demonstration. With a real demonstration. Look at verse 3. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. Okay, he said, by the way, that in itself is an amazing expression. His loving kindness, David said, is better than life. In other words, even if I die, his, his, his loving kindness is better than life. If God wants to take me away, if God wants to kill me, that's fine. His loving kindness is better than life. In fact, I've got this, these two verses in my prayer list that I go through, and I, it comes up on, on a regular basis a couple of times a week. And I'm always struck by that. His, can I say His loving kindness to me is better than life? We hold dear to life. We say, no, my loving, His loving kindness is better than life. But notice what it says. So it is, verse number three, because thy loving kindness is better than life, what are you going to do? It's going to provide a demonstration. He said, because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall, again, there it is. He said, this is what I'm going to do. My lips shall praise thee. In other words, I'll have lips of praise. My, if I focus my seeking on God, it's going to produce a real demonstration. I'm not talking about a fake demonstration, a real demonstration with lips of praise. I'm going to learn how to praise God. My words are going to be about God, lifting up God. It's going to be lips of praise. Number two, it's going to be life of blessing, a life of blessing. Look what it says. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. In other words, he says, while I'm living, as long as I'm alive, I'm going to bless you, God. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to lift up your name. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to do things that please you and bless you. And I'm going to magnify you as long as I'm alive. A life of blessing. That means all my life, and that means my life is that, blessing God. By the way, that is a good desire, that we have a life that blesses God. But see, here it is. It's a real demonstration. He's seeking that, desiring that as a resolution. He said, I'm going to focus my seeking on God, and when I do do that, I'm going to seek a real demonstration with a life of blessing and then the lifting of hands and the lifting of hands. Notice what it says. Because thy loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. He said, I'm going to praise you. And thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. Again, I have these verses uh, in my prayer list as I go through. It's not the lifting of the hands, but it's really the emerging, immersing of ourselves in prayer. 
It's the idea. See, when you, if, if the old idea, we do it sometimes, we lift and magnify God, we lift up the hands. We do that if we're not doing it by just show, if we're doing it because we're immersed in our love for Him. We're immersed in our praise for Him. We're immersed in our prayers. Maybe it's begging God, beseeching God, saying, God, I need you. I need this. I'm in this dry spell. I need you. Maybe it's the lifting of hands of that. Maybe it's the idea of giving the blessings and praise to God. But the whole idea is I'm immersed in my walk. I'm immersed in my prayer. I'm immersed in my praise, whether you lift your hands or not. It's the lifting of the hands of your heart, if you will, and of your spirit. Whoa, a real demonstration. Why? Because I'm seeking my God. I'm focusing my seeking. What do I want in my life? What do I want? Not a bigger car, not a promotion, but I'm in this dry spell. And if I'm going to survive and if I'm going to get through this dry spell, I've got to learn to focus on Him. And in that focus is going to produce a real demonstration in my life. Very quickly, focus your seeking on God. A second resolution, fulfill your satisfaction in your God. And we'll be done in a moment. We'll go quickly. Fulfill your satisfaction in your God. Not only do you seek Him, but you're going to look for, you're going to fulfill your satisfaction. Verse number five, my soul shall be. Again, here, he's looking ahead. He says, it's not necessarily now, but it will be. I'm going to do this. My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness. The idea is my, I'm going to be satisfied. It's like being at a feast. It's like being at a feast or when they had the sacrifices there in the tabernacle and they were, some of the sacrifices, the people that brought the sacrifice got to partake of the meat while it was boiled or when it was cooked, they got to partake of it. He said, man, I'm just going to be satisfied. As with marrow and fatness. He said, boy, when we've had a big meal, oh, you know what it's like after Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving afternoon, boy, you are satisfied. You are full. He said, that's what I'm going to be. I want to be satisfied. My soul shall be satisfied with sorrow and fatness. Why? Because we're lifting up our hands to God. We're praying to God. But we've got this idea. I'm going to find my satisfaction in God. In other words, I'm going to say, God, I only want to be satisfied with you. Oh, we, we try to find satisfaction in so many places. Very quickly, how do we fulfill our satisfaction in God if we're going to make it through these dry spells? Number one, it's a contemplative satisfaction. It's a contemplative satisfaction. If, you, if you've drifted out, come back and look at this. Verse number six. Verse five, my soul shall be satisfied as with morrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When is that going to happen? When I rem- notice what it says, it's not a period, it's a semicolon there. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. How do we find satisfaction with God? It's when we spend time remembering Him, thinking on Him, contemplating Him. See, if we spend no time with God or minimal time with God, we won't be satisfied with Him. Because our minds and hearts are going to be on possessions and it's going to be on money, it's going to be on retirement, it's going to be on all these other things, popularity. But when I spend enough time contemplating God, thinking about God there throughout the night and there on my bed and I begin to more think about Him, the more we think about who He is and what He's done and remember all the traits that God has told us about Himself, then we will find ourselves, you know, I'm just satisfied with having God. Oh, I think about the world, I think about those money, but He said, but boy, when I know who God is and what God's going to do and what God's preparing for me, I will be satisfied. It's a contemplative satisfaction. I don't say, preacher, I'm not satisfied with God. You're not being critical. You're just saying, I just don't find the satisfaction. You're not spending time enough with Him. You're not spending enough time thinking about Him. It's a contemplative satisfaction. It's a complete satisfaction. Verse number five. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fat. He says, man, just like with those complete satisfaction, like I said, completely satisfied, like after Thanksgiving, I am just full. I am satisfied. I do not want anymore, and I do not desire anymore. And then it's a calling out satisfaction. Oh, when we're satisfied with God, what a blessed thing. We need this as a resolution if we're going to make it to the dry spells. This isn't a dry spell. He said, this is what I'm going to do. He didn't feel like it. He said, I'm dry, but I will do this. It's a calling out satisfaction. Verse 5, latter part. Verse 5, My soul shall be satisfied with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. In other words, man, it's, that phrase there, I will praise thee. 
talks about a calling out. It's talking about a shout. It's talking about a shriek. Man, we're calling out our satisfaction. So we're going to fulfill our satisfaction with God. Why, what, how am I going to survive the dry spell? I'm going to fulfill my satisfaction, seek my satisfaction all in God by contemplating and making it complete. That's all I'm going to want. And a calling out, my words will come out. I want to get to the place where my satisfaction is just overflowing and it's a calling out. The third resolution is we must find our security in our God. Find our security in our God. Boy, he's in a dangerous land, a dry land. His son is after him as uh, the world is forsaken. Boy, what an amazing thing. But here he is. Find your your security in God. Verse number 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. How can he rejoice in the shadow of the wings? Because... Thou hast been my help. In remembrances. He's remembering. He's remembering how God has provided in the past. David now, he's king. But from the shepherd boy on with Goliath and everything else, he remembers how God has protected him. He remembered how God had provided for him. He remembered those things, what he said, how God has helped him. So what you do is you start, you want to find your security in God, start remembering how God helped you last week, how God helped you last time you lost a job, how God helped you last time when there was difficulties in your life. In remembrances, Find your security in Him by remembering what He's already done. See, that's why it's important that you and I live by faith. So as we step out in faith and see God do His work, as we see God help us, then the next time we've got a difficulty, we can remember how God helped us. The problem with people who are not living by faith and not walking by faith and not serving God and not obeying God, they don't have anything to remember when they hit the dry spells. They don't have anything to remember, but they say, no, I remember because this happened and I looked to you, God, and you delivered me and I remembered this and I remember that. So now, God, I can find my security, even in the dry spells, in what you did. In remembrance, I find my security in my God, in Him, not my finances, not my government, not my political party, but in God, in remembrances, and in resting and rejoicing. Verse 7 again, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. Under the shadow of the wings is a rest, like a mother hen has her her chicks underneath the wing, and rejoice, just resting and rejoicing. Verse number one. O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. How are we going to survive it? We've seen it. Three regiments got to have them in place. And three resolutions. What you're going to do in that dry, thirsty land. Let's bow our heads, please.